that we start. Welcome, everybody. Um, I um, thank you so much for joining the NAMI Maryland Conference, the 40th NAMI Maryland Conference. My name is Tone Gardenias. I've been a board member of NAMI Maryland since 2014, and I've seen this conference grow over the years. So that's wonderful. I'll be your moderator. The workshop session is NAMI in our own voice, sharing our stories, presented by NAMI program leaders Tevis Simon and Shannon Parkin. You can read more about our amazing presenters, including their bios in the digital conference room on the official website. In this workshop, Shannon and Tevis, living with mental illness, will lead an interactive presentation about living with mental illness. Here, their personal stories of struggles, acceptance, treatment, coping strategies, successes, hopes, and dreams. If this is not the workshop you were meant to attend, please click the back button on your browser or click on the sessions button on the left side of your screen to return to the full list of workshops. We will be addressing questions at the end of this presentation. If you have any questions as the presentation continues, please post them to the Q&A on the right hand side. We will be reviewing questions as they come in. And if something is particularly unclear or needs to be expanded, we will ask the presenters to uh, deal with that after their presentations. We're pleased to offer um, uh, closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. You must have heard this by now, how this works. You click on the CC button. If you have any comments, concerns, or technical issues, please post them to our chat. And our technical assistant, D, who you can see is available and can address them. Um, I'd now like to um, welcome our presenters, Travis and Shannon, and really want to hand it over to you. There you go. Thanks very much. Thank you for being here to hear Tevis Simon and I share our mental health recovery stories. We will be using the NAMI in our own voice format. I will begin by introducing myself, share what happened to me. Then Tevis will introduce herself and share what happened to her. Then each of us will share what helped us and we will finish with what is next for us. There will be time for questions at the end. Introducing me, I am the proud mother of two children in college. Throughout my life, I've surrounded myself with children's books. I read picture books with young children and in my spare time, listen to audiobooks of middle grade fiction. I enjoy swimming and walking. I am also active in my faith community, Silver Spring United Methodist Church, a multiracial reconciling congregation where all are welcome. I've attended worship services at the church since 2007. I am incredibly fortunate that my church supported me throughout my mental health challenges. I understand that some people experiencing mental illness have been harmed by some faith communities and hope that by sharing my story, more places of worship will be supportive and caring to everyone. I write and speak about mental health recovery. I advocate for suicide prevention and to reduce stigma for those who face mental health challenges. Two weeks ago, I was a keynote presenter at the To Be Continued Suicide Prevention Conference in Minnesota. One of my ministers, Reverend Michelle Johns from Silver Spring United Methodist Church, and I spoke on how faith communities can welcome and support suicide attempt survivors at the Maryland Suicide Prevention Conference in October of 2021. USA Today published a portion of my story in April of 2020. As a volunteer NAMI Connection Recovery Support Group facilitator, I've co-facilitated over 70 virtual support groups in the last year. I am working towards becoming a certified recovery support specialist in Maryland through NAMI and Ann Arnor and Frederick County. I had a few challenges growing up, as most people do. Both my natural parents were married three times and each struggled with major depression. I was the only child of the mental marriages. Given my complicated family, I joke that I received training in diplomacy from the womb. I moved schools, cities, and sometimes countries and parents every year from fourth to 12th grade. My elder half-brother used to tease me by putting a blanket over my head when we were children, 
I thought I was being smothered. This happened so often when I was a child that to this day, I still cannot wear anything over my head. Fortunately for me, I have thick hair. On the other hand, I know I was privileged as a white youngster and was never was without shelter or food. When I was 17 in 1984, while hiking in the rocks at Rockies, I accidentally fell 25 feet. Some amazing friends ran down the mountain and called Flight for Life. Other friends sat with me on the mountainside until a helicopter blew me out to a Boulder hospital. I suffered a traumatic brain injury. I was comatose for about four days. I had no memory of my hiking fall or the first two weeks afterwards. I delayed entering college a year, but eventually completed both college and graduate school. I married in 1996. I worked first in a nonprofit and then teaching high school at private schools, but each job turned out to be too difficult for me, given my deficits due to my brain injury. My two wonderful children were born in 2001 and 2004. I love my children with all my heart. However, the long-term effects of my brain injury persisted, including confusion, depression, and fatigue. In an attempt to compensate for my deficits, I controlled what I could by over-exercising and limiting my eating. I was diagnosed with anorexia in college, and these habits followed me for 30 years. Although I never took drugs or, or drank alcohol, under-eating and over-exercising was my addiction. I neglected basic household chores and my physical health because of my deficits, including obsessive-compulsive disorder, I stopped driving. In 2010, my marriage ended. After a couple of years, I was able to get on Social Security disability, but still had severe depression. In 2015, my mental illness caused me to attempt suicide by jumping in front of a metro train. NAMI, my doctors, recreational therapists, church community, friends and families empowered me to recover and find my lens of hope, the details of which I will share with you after Tevis introduces herself and tell, tells us what happened to her. Tevis. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so starting with my what happened, uh, but first sharing a little bit about me. I've been with NAMI since 2015. I'm a peer recovery specialist. I'm also a support group uh, facilitator, and I will soon be an In Our Own Voice uh, state trainer, uh, beginning in 2023. I'm absolutely excited about that. So sharing a little bit about my what happened, um, I was born here in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a resident of West Baltimore, been a resident of West Baltimore since I was a very little girl. Um, I remember, excuse me, I remember as a little girl um, during that time of life where we all remember being a latchkey kid. So I remember that was supposed to be a very exciting time. I remember that time being filled with anxiety. But during that time of my life, I didn't know what anxiety was. I just remember being a little girl and I would bite the inside of my skin or my, or my lips and on my jaw until it bled. I would peel my bottom lip uh, with, with the dry skin and things like that until it bled. I would pick the cuticles around my fingernails until they bled. And I remember doing this every day. I would do it when I left home on my way to school. I would do it on my way home from school or leaving anywhere on my way home. Home during that time in the 80s, um, I resided in uh, Lexington Terrace housing projects and it wasn't a healthy space, but my mom did the best job she could to make the space healthy. Um, I came up during that time where my mother used to say, we live in the projects, but we won't be project-ish. Okay, anybody understand what that means? My mother was very big on education. So education is very important to me. But even through all of that, I saw my mother succumb to addiction. Even while being the very best mother that she could be, there was no room for us to discuss mental health. There was no room for us to discuss mental illness. I saw tons of black women and black men going through um, the ins and outs of poverty and trying to survive Reaganomics, which was the 1980s. And a lot of us, which were the children of our parents, we watched as they dealt with addiction, we watch as they dealt with hardships and we dealt with anxiety, we dealt with depression and we never knew about it. As I continued to grow through life again, never having any conversation about mental health, never discussing my anxiety, 
all of the issues that I had as it relates to the peeling of the skin in my mouth and the cuticles and things like that began to get worse. I remember constantly profusely sweating when I would be uncomfortable in awkward environments. Um, I remember just never really feeling like I was safe or comfortable. And as I got through life, I just basically went through life. I just survived like we all did. So surviving through life, I became pregnant at 16. So now I have an adult responsibility on my plate in addition to dealing with anxiety and depression. But of course, anxiety and depression had to go to the back burner because being a parent became a priority. As I'm raising my daughter, by the time I reached the age of the cusp of 21, my mother unfortunately died of a heroin overdose. So now I have to deal with my reality of not having my mother and now being a young mother and also dealing with the reality of losing my mother to her addiction. So naturally that brought back the anxiety. It brought back the, the biting of the lip and it brought back um, a, a lot of unhealthy, unhealthy things. So I'm parenting and parenting and parenting, you guys. And I just go through life, y'all, like everybody else. I'm raising my daughter. I'm, I'm, I got married at 26. Um, I thought it was the best thing for me to do and to be because I wanted to create some normalcy for myself and my family. And I go through life and things happen as they do. And life happened to me. I was the victim of a home invasion. And that was in 2011. And in 2011, I remember going to the doctor's office, sitting down with my primary care physician and crying hysterically because I couldn't believe what happened to me. And I remember sharing with the doctor all of the feelings that I had and all of these emotions that I felt, sharing with her my childhood and, and, and sharing with her that the feeling of anxiety is what I'm feeling now, that feeling of fear, that feeling of I can't stop biting the inside of my lip, I can't stop peeling the skin, I can't stop picking my cuticles. And in that moment, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder with agoraphobia. Uh, due to the break-in, I was also diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm also diagnosed with major depressive disorder. During that time of the, um, of the home invasion, I was employed. I was working a full-time job. Uh, my daughter was in her junior year of high school. Uh, she was going to public school and it was a big deal. And I say that because from pre-K through 11th grade, she was in private school. So here we are in public school. Mom has just gone through a hell of fight event and I could not allow, I, I just couldn't give my daughter the freedom that she needed. So naturally that um, put some, some strain on our relationship. And um, as I continue to grow, as I continue to progress through my diagnosis, I recognized that I had to come to a conclusion as it relates to my employer because the employer did not understand how long depression or anxiety disorder lasts. So that's just a little bit about my what happened. Shannon. Thank you, Tavis. I will now share what helped me. Rescuers and doctors were able to save my life. I suffered multiple broken bones and another injury to my brain. Doctors had to amputate the front portion of both my feet. I have no memory of my suicide attempt or the first six weeks afterwards. During the first days of my hospitalization, my friend of 30 years, Marita, sat beside my bed singing, It is well with my soul. Very appropriately, their father took full custody of our children. A member of my church, whom I will call Olivia, was on the train I jumped in front of. Olivia went to church that Sunday morning and offered prayers for the woman who had been struck without knowing it was me. Reverend Michelle Johns led the prayers that morning. My first memory is when our lead pastor and her friend brought my daughter, who had just turned 14 years old, to see me in the hospital six weeks after my suicide attempt. I spent six months hospitalized, including four months on the behavioral health unit, where I learned to walk, how to walk again on my remaining half right foot and three quarters of a left. Doctors found the right combination of antidepressants for me. After my hospital stay, I moved into the first of several assisted living facilities where I would reside for the next five years. 
At a local medical clinic, I began electric convulsive therapy that I continued for more than a year. At each session, electrodes were taped to my forehead. I received an anesthesia, so I was sedated while my brain was electrically stimulated. stimulated. Nurses held my hand as they placed the IV and stood beside me with smiling faces when I woke at the end of each session. I did present a challenge to them because the usual way to determine responsiveness under a sedative is monitoring the toes. This is not possible in my case as I have only partial feet, but those nurses adapted and never lost their ability to smile, encouraging me to do the same. While I was still hospitalized, my friend Ellen called the helpline of NAMI Montgomery County in Maryland. With NAMI's help, I connected with a group of therapists, including Debbie, a recreational therapist with 40 years of experience. Through her, I learned that recreational therapy enables people to recover through activities they enjoy. When Debbie asked me when I had found moments of joy in my life, I told her that after months of hospitalizations, I just longed to be outside. I asked her if we could go on walks, as I was not allowed to leave the facility where I resided alone. Debbie and I learned about each other as we strolled on neighboring paths. With Debbie at my side, I learned to laugh at the fact that I needed to walk like a duck to maintain my balance on my partial feet. I told her that while I would miss wearing flip-flops, I was glad I would never again be asked to wear high heels. Debbie's encouragement encouraged me to return to reading children's books that I have shared throughout my life. She helped me enroll in the training class offered through the Literacy Council to teach adults how to read. For more than a year, I met weekly with an Egyptian woman teaching her how to read picture books that she then read with her grandchildren. When I told Debbie that I had swum competitively in high school and college, she took me to the local pool. I was not afraid of the water since I spent so much time in pools during my younger years, but I was concerned about what people would say when they saw my partial feet. I still remember Debbie's hand on my back as she cheered me into the locker room for the first time since my suicide attempt. I was met with a familiar smell of chlorine and began to relax. After a few times at the pool, I soon realized people rarely mentioned my feet. They may have stared, but given that my eyesight is poor without my glasses, I did not notice. I was just happy to be in a swimming pool where my feet mattered a little. The first time my children saw my bare feet was four years after my suicide attempt, when we were swimming together at a na friend's neighborhood pool. In the bright sunshine of the day, each of us climbed in the water and began to swim and splash. After about 20 minutes, my 18-year-old daughter sank beneath the water in front of me as I stood in the shallow end, talking with my friend and my 15-year-old son. After about 10 seconds underwater, my daughter reappeared and said, Mom, this is the first time we've seen your feet. I asked her and my son if they had any questions. My son asked me, Mom, can you still do the butterfly stroke? I had been swimming by myself for some time at that point, and the competitive swimmer in me resurfaced. I'd swum the stroke previously, but decided to have fun with my kids. I said the butterfly was more difficult because the dolphin kick really requires toes, but I'd give it a try. I swam the length of the pool and back doing a passable butterfly, although probably not competitively legal. My daughter said, Mom, I'm proud of you. My son said, so am I, Mom. You're pretty cool. In the years after my suicide attempt, the Silver Spring United Methodist Church provided me a caring community and became my surrogate family, encouraging me in my medical treatment. I became friends with an older couple who joined the church at the same time I did. Over time, I been con began calling them Mom and Dad because I saw them as my church parents. They visited me every week throughout my six-month hospital stay, including the four months on the behavioral health unit. This wonderful couple also supported me throughout my five years residing in assisted living facilities, even helping me move when I was transferred from one facility to another. These consistent, caring relationships enabled me to see a hopeful future. I recall at one worship service, my church mom said to me gently, your shoe is untied. Would you like me to tie it for you? I was so proud to be wearing real tennis shoes instead of the bracelets on my knee that I'd worn before that week. I'd forgotten that tennis shoes need to be tied to be effective, but my church mom was there to remind me. My right forearm has significant scarring. 
from the injuries I sustained from my suicide attempt. And I do apologize about the lighting. I just can't get more light in my apartment here. On my right elbow is a skin graft. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to show it, but it's a skin graft that appears as an extra patch of skin. I recall while in the hospital in a group session on the behavioral health unit, another patient refused to sit beside me because she did not want to, quote, catch no tumor, referring to the my right elbow. After that incident, I asked if the skin graft could be removed, but was told Medicare would not pay for what was termed as cosmetic surgery. For the first three years after my suicide attempt, I always wore long sleeves when I was around my children, so they would not see my scarring. In May of 2018, while at church, the place where I saw my children regularly, I asked first my daughter and then her younger brother if it would be all right with them if I wore short sleeves around them. They each told me they were ready to see my scars. About three months later, my daughter, then 17, sat to the right of me in a church meeting. For the first 15 minutes of the meeting, she massaged the extra skin on my right elbow. At the end of the meeting, she turned to me and said, Mom, it's okay. You have a wiggly elbow. I knew then that I would never again consider having my wiggly elbow removed for it is a constant reminder of how life embraced me, pulling me back from the edge my mental illness had taken me. In April of 2018, my psychiatrist told me he thought I was ready to ride the Metro again, but he wanted me to ride first with my recreational therapist, Debbie. By coincidence on that first ride, Debbie and I both wore orange t-shirts. When we reached the platform, I looked at Debbie's face, not at the tracks, as the train pulled into the station. Debbie took my hand and we boarded the train. We agreed we would ride only one stop before turning around and returning. We found a seat close to the door because my partial feet didn't give, don't give me the bounce to stand on a moving train or a moving bus for that matter. At the next station, my confidence rocketed when the door opened. As we stepped off the train, I reached my hand back for Debbie. She said, let me just switch my bag to the other shoulder so I don't trip you. I joked with her by saying, yeah, that would not be something you'd want to put on your resume. As we laughed standing on the platform, I saw a white bird with outstretched wings sail across the blue sky. I still focused on Debbie's face as I heard the train approach the station, but this time I didn't have to fight the urge to cover my ears. Debbie and I rode the Metro together every week for the next month. On our third trip together as we stood on the platform, I told Debbie about the phone conversation I had had the previous night with my daughter. Then it ended when I said to my daughter, I love you very much. My daughter had replied, I love you very much too, Mom. As I told Debbie about that conversation, at the same moment, I saw a mother bidding goodbye to her own daughter, a toddler in a stroller, by making a heart shape with her fingers. By focusing on the paired images of the heart-shaped fingers and the echo of my own daughter's words, I love you very much too, Mom, I was able to watch the train arrive at the station with a smile on my face something I had previously never dreamed possible. By using that same image on our next trip, I found I could watch the train arrive at the station without fear. Two weeks later in May of 2018, my psychiatrist gave his full approval for me to ride the Metro independently. I happily shared the news with my church family. As I sat with Olivia, who had been on the train I stepped in front of in 2015 and my church parents. Two months after I'd begun riding the Metro independently, I learned Olivia would be leading a group from our church to go to a baseball game. The group would be riding together on the Metro. I wanted to go, but I was worried my presence on the train would cause church members to be uncomfortable. Very tentatively, I asked Olivia if I could join the group. Without a moment's hesitation, she said, definitely, I've got your back, always have, always will. With those words and a successful trip to the ball game, I knew I never had, never would walk alone. During the fir fir first months of the pandemic, I still resided in assisted living. For two months, I was told to stay in my small suite, consisting of a bedroom, a tiny kitchen area, and a bathroom. I was more anxious than ever to move and live independently in my own apartment. My psychiatrist had to prove the plan. 
I resolved to prove I could remain positive, even in these difficult circumstances. I began keeping a daily gratitude log that I learned about through the support groups and the volunteer work I did with NAMI. In this gratitude log, I kept track of every phone call and online interaction I had with my children, friends, and church members. I wrote in my gratitude for my church friends who dropped off groceries for me weekly. I even wrote about the joy of seeing a bird flying with wings stretched wide outside my window. During those early months of the pandemic, Reverend Michelle called me every week and one phone conversation as I described my gratitude journal in detail. Reverend Michelle appeared unusually quiet. I asked her why. She replied she didn't want to interrupt me. I told her, please don't worry about interrupting me. I think you know there's no way you can step on my toes. We laughed together. This conversation was one of many examples of caring people supporting me as I learned to find humor in my situation. I recall one friend, a math tutor, who encouraged me to walk on my own two feet. The friend had seen my partial feet and had helped me find a shoe specialist. I asked my friend, how much is one and one, three, one and three quarter, one, one half and three quarters? My wise friend replied, one and one quarter, but you need to find your own answer. Caring people who talk and laugh with me empower me to realize that one half plus three quarters will always equal infinity for me. Pandemic or not. In October of 2020, after five years of residing in assisted living facilities, I was given approval by my psychiatrist and therapist to move into my own apartment. Church members helped me move. Almost two years have passed since I moved into my apartment. I continue to keep my gratitude journal. Initially, I started it only to prove I could live on my own. Now maintaining this log is as much a daily practice for me as taking my antidepressant medications. Last week, I wrote not day 900 in my gratitude log. One of the things I'm thankful for is this journal itself. It gives me the opportunity to chronicle the gifts I received and the lessons I learned as I work through challenges. Now, Tevis will share what helped her. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so what helps me, uh, first of all, I have to say that I love this segment. The first segment is like a ride on a roller coaster. Uh, the second and third is it's almost like the journey comes full circle for folks to understand how and why we share the story the way that we do. Uh, so what has helped me and what helps me? So after resigning from the position that I was working in 2011 and um, intensively working on the relationship with my daughter, rebuilding that, um, you know, based upon the heaviness that it went through with my anxiety disorder and depression um, and how it affect her ability to really live her life and explore some teenage freedom, um, you know, after resigning and working on our relationship um, simultaneously, I began um, to seek out resources that could assist me in terms of my mental health, that could assist me in growing and progressing in my life and having a full life. And I recalled um, hearing about NAMI and reading on, you know, the services that they offered, but I wasn't ready at the time. Uh, but in 2015, I was ready and I joined NAMI and that was an absolute game changer for me. Um, it has helped me tremendously. NAMI has become a family for me. As I shared in the beginning, um, in December, I'll begin a training to um, actually instruct and support and empower folks on how to tell their stories the same as Shannon and I are doing for in our own voice. So I'm so excited about that. Uh, what also helps me is exercise. Um, I've lost over 20 pounds. Um, I'm in the gym every day. I've become a gym rat. Um, call it what you want. Judge me if you must. But, you know, I, I, I love what I'm becoming because I'm putting me first. Um, Another thing that helps me is, you know, being my authentic self. I must say that, uh, you know, in the world that we live in, in the current climate, it's trendy to be yourself. It's trendy to be spiritual. It's trendy to be all of these things. But what we are to the soul, what we are to our spirit is what's really important. And what I can say in this time in my life, that this is the most that I've ever loved Tevis. And I love me so much, y'all. It's ridiculous. And it feels so good, especially when you've been down for so long. So putting myself in situations, or I should more say environments and around people that love me, that respect 
disrespect me, that want to be educated if they don't know about mental health and wellness. They want to be educated on my diagnosis. They want to understand agoraphobia. That's what helps me. Being around people that want to learn, um, that want to love on me, that want to love on others, that love themselves. Uh, being in environments where I'm educating, where I'm empowering, I'm loving on my family. Y'all, I'm a grandmother of an awesome three-year-old grandson that I love to life. And he is discovering the toilet and, and how it flushes and the water disappears and comes back. I mean, somebody might be saying that's not a big deal, but to a toddler, that's a big deal. And when you watch the world through a toddler's eyes, not just with the toilet flushing, but with everything, it's amazing and it's exciting. Um, so that's what helps me. And again, like hanging out with my daughter, she keeps me relevant. She keeps me on my game um, and she loves me, you know. So I just can't say it enough, y'all. And, and, and if you didn't know, today is National Love. I love you day. October the 14th. Google it. Yep. So I'm full of that today. Um, and again, what helps me is, is education because that empowers me. I was a fearful little girl. I was a fearful young woman. And now I feel empowered. There's so many other things that help, but I'll just stop right there. Go ahead, Shannon, with the next segment. Thank you, Tavis. That's wonderful. I will now share what's next for me. I will always remember the first time I heard an inner own voice speaker share how they recovered after decades of mental illness and attempting suicide. That moment, my eyes opened to the possibility that I might one day progress far enough in my recovery to share my story. Having lived with depression for 40 years, my mental illness has always been like the smothering blanket my brother used to put over my head when I was a child, limiting my ability to breathe freely. The stigma and shame of being a suicide attempt survivor with a disabling injury I could not hide was an additional heavier blanket on top of me. Hearing that NAMI speaker share his recovery story punched a hole in the smothering blanket on top of me, allowing to breathe more fully, more freely, celebrating life fully. After I completed the training to become an inner own voice speaker in January of 2019, I found a sense of purpose and meaning. Hearing the stories of others empowered me as I learned to focus through a lens of hope. I've been asked how I cope with any shame I, I feel about my suicide attempt. Of course I regret the major depression caused me to jump in front of a train. Today, however, I have tremendous gratitude for the support I do have. My therapist, church, and friends have taught me to learn from my past. Through their words, I realize that any shame I may have is essentially a prison of my own design. The care of my supporters enables me to build bridges to a better tomorrow. Realizing, realizing I cannot change what has already occurred, I ask myself what I can learn from all my experiences, both positive and negative, to live fully today and in the future. When my teenage son first saw my partial feet, he simply asked if I could swim butterfly. With that question, he taught me an incredible lesson about focusing on what I can do now and in the future, not on the toes I lack or the pain of the past. In addition to becoming an inner own voice speaker, I have co-facilitated more than 70 virtual support groups through NAMI. Connection Recovery Support Groups through NAMI. In these groups, I have learned from those with different mental health challenges, including suicide attempt survivors. One woman described how with the help of her therapist, she reframed the anniversary of her suicide attempt. Instead of remembering the moment when depression almost killed her, she chose to see that day as a time when life fully embraced her, pulling her back from the edge to which her illness had driven her. She taught me so much in that moment. And I learn in every support group I facilitate. I will spend the rest of my life, life sharing my recovery story, encouraging others to share their recovery journeys. I know my recovery happened not because of who I am, but because of the people who supported me, including NAMI, Silver Spring United Methodist Church, on our own Frederick County, as well as my doctor's friends and family. As I share my story, I want to be a light of hope for my own children, as well as all those who face mental health challenges. By sharing how I support it, I want to encourage those in their community. 
Stories and hope and recovery have the power to help others and dispel stigma and myths about suicide. For every person that dies by suicide, 25 people attempt suicide and 316 people consider suicide, but do not kill themselves. These numbers show there are millions who have attempted suicide and are seriously considered suicide, but have found hope and gone out to live out their lives, out their lives fully. Every recovery story has the power to save lives. On Easter Sunday, 2022, our church's first in-person Easter service since 2019, Reverend Michelle announced from the pulpit, as I sat beside Olivia, who had been on that train in 2015, that I had won a national award for sharing my mental health recovery story. The end of April, I made my first independent plane flight in 12 years to receive the Transforming Lived Experience Award from the American Association of Suicidology, the oldest suicide prevention organization in the nation at their conference in Chicago. And yes, if you're wondering, I did take my shoes off as I went through and went, and went in socks over my partial feet through security. As I received that award, I said, I spent decades never knowing anyone could recover after a suicide attempt or get over suicidal ideation. I know many of you have your own recovery stories or know of someone who is on that journey themselves. We need you to talk and write about your recovery. Each and every story matters. I found my lens of hope and grace and know you can as well. Resilience is built through community. Your story is important. Believe in it and shout it out. Thank you. Now Tevis will share what is next for her. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, what's next? This is always an exciting piece. I love hearing the co-presenters, what's next? And then I share mine. So what's next for me, you guys, I always say this. Um, you don't know this, but you all don't know this. But every, every time we get to this segment, I say this line. What's next for me is everything that is good, everything that is positive, everything that is powerful, everything that is progressive. That is what's next for me. Now, to get into more detail of that, um, I am currently employed. So to pick up from that, what happened, what's next kind of thing. Life did not, you know, life was not all lost and that wasn't the last job. I am currently employed and I love where I'm currently employed in the work that I do within the community, specifically within West Baltimore. Um, in addition to that, I plan on continuing my education. I also have a ministry, which is Walk by Faith Consulting. And what it does is assist those with mental health conditions and also those that may have a dual substance abuse issue. Because as I've shared, substance abuse and those that uh, deal with substance abuse issues and overcome those conditions is something that's very near and dear to my heart due to my mom passing of her um, of her addiction and her health condition, because addiction is a health condition. Um, what's also next for me is um, furthering opportunities for others to share their stories, creating platforms for that, um, opening up doors the best that I can, shedding light on the greatness that comes out of Baltimore City and out of West Baltimore. Um, let's see, what else did I put on my, my thing? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. What else did I put on here? Oh, continuing to do uh, NAMI affiliations and trainings and growing my business and living and loving life. And, you know, just just pouring into my family, pouring into my friends. Uh, one thing I've recognized and I appreciate is the fact that how much I love myself and how much it is important to me to eradicate the stigma that surrounds mental health conditions, uh, mental illness. Uh, the people that are in my life, they recognize that it's not OK to use terms as bipolar when you're discussing the weather or someone's attitude. Folks know that it's not OK to use derogatory statements and comments as it relates to mental health and wellness when they talk to Tevis. And I like that because that means that with every health condition out here, when it comes to cancer, when it comes to lupus, folks put respect on those names. Right. But when it comes to mental health conditions, the same respect is in there. So I say put some respect on mental health conditions because I think it would change the gamut of how we look at it, how we support it, and how we treat each other. Thank y'all so much for out for the time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tavis. Absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you to our moderators. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. It was so you know, incredible to listen to your stories. 
I mean, you, I don't, I don't know if you've had a chance to look to look into the chat with all the reactions. They're pretty, pretty self-descriptive there. I, I just, I mean, there's no immediate question. So, so one question that came up to me that I wanted to ask you, hesitating a little bit, but I can imagine that each of you might have had. I mean, both of you have described the clear change in your life and you took it on when there was a, a really paradigm shift occurring. But since that shift and since you took it on and took your long road to recovery, there must have been relapses. Mm -hmm. And so, and if so, can you share with us how you dealt with the relapses? Do you have like a, a game plan? Did you start to use a game plan for those? Mm -hmm. Um, Shannon, you want to go first? I can go sure, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll answer that. Um, I guess I would give a re very real example. The biggest challenge that I have right now is when I have a lot of stress, I get intense headaches. And I've been in trainings and conferences for the last two days and the week before I had COVID because I had to fly out to Minnesota for a suicide prevention conference. And so right now I have a headache. But what I did today to deal with it and preparing for this is that I went outside and I walked. And I just put my face up to the sun and felt the sun on my, on my head. I heard the birds sing. And for me, the birds are so helpful. Being outside feeds my soul. Um, in part because I spent six months in, in a mental health hospital, on a baby health unit, I mean, in the hospital. So I couldn't be outside. And, and even when I was in assisted living, you know, for the first couple of years, I couldn't even walk down the street on my own. Um, and so being outside, um, the other thing is, you know, um, you know, if for some reason I can't go outside, I listen to, you know, on Google has white noise, birds singing. That's something I use as a, as a technique. So. Okay. Uh, what helps me, um, the toolkit is the, is the perfect term that I use because that's actually <laughs> how I word it. Um, one of the things that helps me, especially with, um, um, with situations like this, where I have a presentation and I deal with agoraphobia, um, I'm often going into my toolbox, um, pulling out those necessary tools. And one of those things that I pull out, the most important for me are my affirmations. Remembering who I am, who I belong to, um, a higher power, and what my purpose is. Um, as corny as that may sound, it really, really helps me. In addition to that, I journal. So, you know, it, it's my thing. I, I have to get all of the words that are in my brain out on paper. Another thing I do is dance. That is my thing. Like, Never mind if I can actually dance, guys. That's not the question here. That's not the information I'm providing. <laughs> I dance. I put on some good music. You know what I mean? I play with my dog. Um, and, and also, you know, to keep it all the way real, um, the relationship that I have with my mental health professionals, my team. I have two women, and they are powerful and awesome. And I have a psychotherapist and a therapist, and they've given me their contact information. So if it really gets that heavy where I'm just like, ah, I don't know what to do. I can text them. I can call them, you know? So yeah, the toolbox, thanks for that question because it's, it's real. Like relapse is a real thing and it's something that we don't often discuss. Um, but it definitely happens and going into that toolbox, getting out those tools that, yeah, it reaffirms the purpose and keeps it's us focused. A, is this toolbox something that you've written down or do you just have it in your head or both <laughs> for me, for me, both, <laughs> both. There's yeah. something, Tevis, you may know, know about this. There's something called the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, mm -hmm. um, which basically it's it's a class that, that and through peer support that helps people develop their own techniques in writing, you know, what helps. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that can be, you know, um, like, you know, that can be very helpful. Um, but I, but I relate very much to what Eva said about being able to know who to call yes. and, um, and who you can trust and also, you know, journaling. Right. Right. Well, I, I, um, and how, and have those relapses gone down because of this? Have you gotten, I mean, I'm pressing this point perhaps too much, so stop me if you don't want me to, but have you become better at managing with the toolbox? If I can describe it also for you, Shannon, have you gotten even stronger? Because yeah, how does this work? Or have you still had, uh, I don't know if you want to share this, but have there still been more precipitous relapses at some point? That happens sometimes too with people, right? I mean, they think it's going really well and it's over and then suddenly, boom, my, my youngest daughter is one of those people. And it, it just goes very, very deep. And mm -hmm. what was your experiences there, Shannon and Thomas? Um, well, one thing that has been very helpful to me is, you know, if I have a difficulty, I think back on when I've had difficulties in the past and how I cope with it. And journaling helps me with that to help me remember. The other thing that I recommend to, to everybody is not only journaling about what I do or whatnot, but I write down every time I take medication, the date, the time, the medication I take and any particular symptoms that I have so that when I meet with my psychiatrist or therapist, I can show that to them and talk with them and help, and they can help me figure out the best techniques to manage moving forward. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's. That I don't know if Tevis has more she wanted to add. We can't hear you, Tavis. You're on mute. Yes. My apologies. My apologies, Tone. I remember, mm -hmm. do you mind giving me the question again? I remember you saying that there can be a deep, you know, it can go into a deep rabbit hole. So what was the, the topic? Yeah, so that? you were mentioning the toolbox. And, and mm -hmm. obviously, you both must have um, experienced how much better you're getting at coping with these relapses. But um, what about the real serious ones? Because you're getting better and better yeah. at managing yourself, yeah. but then suddenly, yeah. boom, there's something yeah. that yeah, you can like It's usually an external event, and it hits you so hard, yeah. and there you go, and you're surprised how deep Well, I'll be honest. You know, again, having a transparent conversation, uh, when I first began the job that I'm working now, I almost quit like 15 times. <laughs> I won't lie to you, because it... it, it it was so many different, so many, so much, so many different stimuli coming at me from my brain. Um, it was overwhelming. And, it, and as I shared with you guys, it wasn't, it's not like I haven't held a job down before. I've been working since I was 14. Okay. But the overwhelming feeling of having anxiety disorder, dealing with agoraphobia, being out in the work world, being out in the world and going to the stores and having to do things and having responsibilities. And what if these responsibilities don't meet my requirements? Or what if I don't meet the requirement? And what if I get fired? That's how the brain was going. And it's easy to go into that rabbit hole. It gets deep and it gets dark and it gets ugly. And again, what I had to do was, and this is the, this is the challenging part, I think, for a lot of us. When you have that come to come to self moment, come to the creator, come to the higher power, whatever you want to call it. But when you come to your when you get with yourself and you say, you know what? I'm not right. I don't feel good. I, I, I feel like something's wrong. So I need to make a call. I need to put something out there so that I can get the help and assistance that I needed. Because for me, when I went through that very hard time, the beginning of this year <laughs> with, you know, my employer, I had to say, I got to admit, I need some help. So I had to have the conversation. And that was the game changer, admitting that I needed the help because this was a new challenge. Right now, this is not a different. This is a different employer. It's still work, but it's new responsibilities. Tevis isn't the same Tevis I was in 2011 or 2015. 
So I needed to to bring who Tevis is today and admit, hey, I need some I need some assistance with this because this rabbit hole is getting deep and I think I want to quit. But I knew quitting wasn't the option, but it was still the honest feeling. You know what I mean? That was still the honest feeling. And I'm happy that you asked that question, Tone, because Shannon and I look good today. We look polished. We look, you know, snazzy, all that good stuff. But no one sees us in the rabbit hole. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you gave a great answer because to yeah. you, making yourself vulnerable, asking for help, that is so essential. That is so essential. Shannon, what are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, just again, um, I mean, even even with, um, you know, having 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 that as Tevis said, having that toolbox that one can rely back on of things that one can use. And for anybody who has a mental illness and, you know, having a list of three specific, you know, three people that you can call and, um, and one of them, you know, if you have suicidal ideation, Ish, you know, it's great to have the the nine eight eight, um, you know, and it was just shared in a, in a presentation uh, last hour about how seventy percent of the people who call nine eight eight that that their their challenges are resolved in that just talking or texting, um, and then as more and more communities get. Um, mobile crisis units though those mobile crisis units um i believe the statistic that was given was that um of those that require mobile crisis units they're able to resolve 60 percent of their calls so it um you know i know you know when i when i suffered from mental illness i uh, you know i had you know i I've advocated for the use of mobile crisis units um, because I, I have been handcuffed and, and put into the backseat of a police car. But I also know, and you know, that's terror. That's hard, was hard, you know, while I'm in a mental health challenge. But I also know that my experience was a relative privilege. The simple fact I'm a white woman with white hair. And, you know, and we need more people to share their stories like Kevis is doing and other people. Um, so, Tevis, if you wanted to share anything more on that front. All right, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, just the, the entire, um, this opportunity overall is empowering. Um, diversity is key. You know, I'm a firm believer that, especially for young people, um, you know, when you see something, you believe that you can become that. And for me, when I do these presentations, I intentionally share where I'm from. I intentionally share that I'm from Baltimore. I'm specific about the fact that I reside in West Baltimore. I recognize the reputation. I recognize that some people only know Baltimore City or West Baltimore for the wire and all that. I, I recognize that. But what I also recognize is that there's beauty in this city and there's beauty in West Baltimore. And if I can be an example of that, I'm not saying that I'm all of that in a bag of chips. But what I am saying is that I believe I'm part of the difference. And I'm one of many strong, powerful, empowered Black women that have a story to tell. And I hope that with yeah. the education that I get and continue to receive, that I empower folks, especially folks that look like me, to share their story. It's so important. It's so important. Yes, we need each and every recovery story to be shared and written about and out there. Absolutely. That's how we destigmatize. You know what I mean? When we have right. more conversations, when we have more stories that are shared, um, it, it creates a full whole conversation, you know, and, and we can begin to say, well, you can't come into our circle and say folks that have mental health diagnosis, all of us want to go into a warehouse and shoot it up. You can't come into our circle and have those kind of conversations, right? Because there's a level of respect and education, you know, the same respect and education that's put when we have conversations about cancer. 
This month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. No one would ever say, you acting like cancer. No one would ever say that. But based upon the weather we've had in the last two weeks, how many of us have heard someone say, this weather's real bipolar? Mm. That's not yeah. right. It's not good. It's not okay. It's not okay. And just for the record, issues are a part of a publication or a magazine. It is not a part of my mental health. I don't have a mental health issue. I have a mental health condition. Well, what you said a few minutes ago about Baltimore brought out a hard on Baltimore chat there. I don't know if you saw that one. Ah, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> yes. All right. Listen, I mean, Nee, could you possibly uh, make a copy of the chats? I don't know how to do that. And it might be nice for Shannon and Tavis to have that because there are so many really nice reactions that both of you received from the audience oh, as you were speaking. Thank you guys. So it's just really nice if, if that's possible, Nee, to do that. I, I mean, it's we're, we're starting to get to a close. There, there were three quotes I wrote down, and I, they cover it as far as I'm concerned. Um, the first one, sort of the beginning, um, um, you know, it was a prison of my own design. I thought that was so powerful. And then uh, the next one I wrote down was um, focus on what you can do, which is also very good. But the most important one is what you are contributing to us today. It's that every recovery story has the power to save a life. So. Thank you so much for being so courageous to share so much very private detail and help us understand better our own lives or your lives and other people's lives. So thanks thank very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And just, you know, I, I the prison of your own design, you know, if you're feeling shame or guilt, that's a prison of your own design. You know, you are alive, you are important. Believe in your recovery and shout it out, you know. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I couldn't think of a better better way to close this. Thanks so much, Shannon. Thanks so much, Davis. Thank you. Apparently, Thank there's you. another workshop Thanks after so much, this. Shannon. We're going to pop this one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I should tell you that there are more workshops than the conference. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Tone. Thank you, Nee. Thank you. And thank you, Nami. Thank you, Thank you. Right. Thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.